today I'd like to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart uh, is design. I've been a product manager for most of my career and uh, I've worked in software startups uh, to uh, one was called Poker Space, and I worked as a product manager at a company called My Vision. More recently, I co-founded Roadmonk, uh, which is road mapping software for the enterprise. Uh, I am from Canada, so I've come from great up north, and so I like to spend my time outdoors, but I'm going to enjoy LA while I'm here. <laughs> so today I want to talk about sort of five major themes around design and how we can really use it in our organizations and teams. And one is talking about empathy and how it's the foundation for design. Two, I want to talk about some of the tactical things that we use in terms of the language. We know product managers have their own language, and I think designers do too. And so I have some real examples that I want to go through. I'm, I'm a more, a more hands-on kind of guy in terms of how I like to learn, so I want to try to replicate that in today's presentation. And number three is that there seems to be this qualitative nature to design, and what I found is there's actually some really good data that we can use to show how important design is at the macro level, and so, so I'm going to show you some of the research that I found. And lastly, uh, if we have some friction within our organizations, how do we bring together a good case to actually move design forward, and, and lastly, integrate it within our processes? Um, so for the first half, I'll be kind of going through these five, and then I've saved some discussion questions at the end that we can have a conversation about. So I'm going to start with empathy. Uh, we all really understand already what empathy is to understand someone's emotions and put ourselves in their own shoes. But what are the activities that we can do in our organizations to really champion that? So there's four things that uh, I think are really important, and the first is uh, getting on support. And what I mean by this is that whenever we actually onboard a new employee, they have to spend their first two weeks on support or do 100 cases at a minimum. If they're in product or design, it's double that. The reason they have to do that is because we want them on calls, we want them in conversation, we do not want to give them secondary information in an onboarding package that they have to read. If I feel like a product manager or designer is out of tune with the market or customer, guess what? It could be week, year two in their, in their time that they've been at the company, they're going to go back on support for a period of time. And that's just a really good way to calibrate on empathy as the organization starts to scale and grow. The second is, and you're probably already familiar with this as product managers, is making sure every single feature or product that you do design is actually championed and understood by a set of users. And not just your customer board that you have going on, but new customers every single time you're building out a new design so that more relationships are formed. And three, we've heard this earlier today, is actually doing customer visits. We have a mandate each quarter that each PM and designer has to do five customer visits. This means they're not just talking to our biggest customers, but they're talking to some of the small and medium ones as well. And last, and certainly not least, this is my new favorite one, especially when sales starts to get a little irked with us, or we get irked with them. To bridge that gap is I have the product people lead the demos actually become a salesperson, do lead the whole conversation. The sales rep's just there for some of the tougher questions, but actually go through and understand those problems that are going on while the demo's happening and how we actually sell our own products. It's nice to build the enablement documents, but when you're actually on that call doing that hour demo or half an hour demo, you really start to understand what the customer is thinking. And this translates to two really important things. One is the use cases, and not, we're not talking about just use cases of which features, but being able to understand how to speak confidently of the order and the workflow that they're using. Uh, and this is really understanding the frequency of how people use their application. Of course, engagement data can augment a lot of this, but I found to build an emotional case where you can walk into a meeting with your execs and say, hey, GM, Nike, and Coca-Cola, this is how they're using our product this week. That builds a real strong case over sometimes data, especially when you're trying to push your agenda or roadmap. So with design language, uh, I wanted to go through sort of six ideas or terms that were constantly used uh, that I've seen from really great designers and we've tried to embody with that, at Roadmonk. So the first one is tell users what to think. And this is different than not thinking, uh, that's another concept that we'll get into, but if you fundamentally understand their workflow, you should be able to figure out what they're trying to do. So when we do our betas, we have an idea of what they should be thinking. And if they're going in and they tell us they're not thinking, hey, this is where the filters are, then we know there's a disconnect. And we have to make sure that 
they're thinking exactly what we want to in the product, or if they tell us something different, we need to follow that if that's what the market uh, adheres to. So I want to go through actually an example uh, of where I've seen this in real life. So this is uh, a flight search engine, which I'm a big fan of, called Kayak. Really well designed, great UI, really simple. Uh, there's a couple things that our eyes are already drawing new attention to. Sort of the orange buttons here where we want to drill down on detail. We can see that we've given an option of filters. We've obviously got this green kind of thing going on there telling us that we should be buying right now because this is a good time. So the UI is great, the UX is great, it's giving us all the details of the flight, but we're not really sure totally where to exactly focus. Um, I obviously want to search and look for flights, so my eyes are going to tend towards here, but there's a lot of information on each of these lines um, that's been given to me. I'm not saying this is a bad design, I actually think this is really good, but there is an opportunity here. So enter Google Flights. Now this is a website that, from a UI perspective, isn't that much prettier or even prettier, pretty enough to compete with Kaya. But what they've done here is a few really important things. One is they've said, here is the priority in which we want you to think about things. We already know you like nonstop flights, so why, why even have to make that a thing? Let's just put them right at the front. Two, we know price is important to you, and even if the price is higher, we'll put the ones that are lower there just to highlight them. Three, we know airlines are important. And four, Wi-Fi is a big thing now for planes. So why not make that front and center? And they just said, these are the best flights that you're going to choose from. They still have all the options at the top, just like Kayak did. But they've kind of graded out, made it light for the filters, and said, here is what we know you want. Um, that, to me, is a great example of telling users what to think based on the knowledge you already have of them. So just to sum that up, uh, show what matters. Uh, UX can sometimes beat UI in certain cases and, and reduce the clutter. If it is secondary, you can find a way to hide it and put it aside, lightly grayed out. There is opportunities that designers can get to, but the principle here is just tell the user what to think. And if you're able to do that, that means you really know your user well and you've empathized them with them correctly. The second term is minimize cognitive load or reduce cognitive load. This is the word that is somehow now a favorite uh, amongst our entire organization. Whenever they're talking about design, they're like, that's got too much cognitive load, or, you know, you know, we got to reduce it over there. It's too fuzzy on that dialogue. And I'm like, wow, this is engineers start saying it. So I I'm, I'm really proud to say that this is probably one of my favorites. Uh, and it's really about finding a focal point for them. And this is kind of not to say you can't make them think, but you want to make them think the least as possible. So I've got a couple examples here from, again, I'm going to choose websites that I love. So even if I'm somewhat critiquing them, I can still say I use them and really enjoy them. This is an early version uh, of a password program that saves your password securely called LastPass. And, and this was a really early version of it. Uh, so one of the things here is that right away, your eyes are just completely overwhelmed by the opportunities and options you can have. There's so many icons with different colors. They're all the same font size. So if you ever heard the, word, the argument from an engineer about consistency, uh, that's actually not a great argument because it doesn't tell you where the focal point is, it doesn't tell you the order of operation that you want in design, and even though it may be consistent, it's actually not very friendly to the user. They have to put in a lot of thought as to what they're trying to do here. So I've got edit, share, and delete are the same as the user manual in terms of their weight, and you're repeating all these things. So it's very difficult to understand. So how they actually solve this problem themselves in their latest version is actually fantastic. They said, what's the first thing that a user needs to do when they get to this application? And I know because I kind of went through this learning it, is that I need to find the program I'm looking for the password for. That's what I really need to do because I either need to change it, edit, delete it. That's really my core action. So what they did is said, OK, we'll make the brands really big and put it in the center. We'll put it to the lighter side because that's usually where our eyes, eyes tend to focus and we'll make a darker menu on the left. Then what they said is, okay, well we don't want the edit and share delete options to just be always represented. So what they did is they put in a hover effect and then they lightly added those secondary options that you knew you were going to do right after as soon as your mouse went there. Those are just like really simple things that reduce the cognitive load on your user and has a very nice emotional experience. But it's those subtleties that really matter. Uh, as another quick example, I have to mention this because 
my staff came and was so excited when Intercom, which is sort of like Zendesk and User Voice, but the new kind of cool version of that in the Valley, uh, changed their navigation. They all came to me and were like, this is the most amazing thing. Uh, they really loved the experience. The old version looked like this, where the top navigation had people, the number of people, the companies, the number of companies, conversations. There was a lot going on on that menu. And they found that this wasn't the most important information to actually represent to the user. So what they did was a couple of really smart things. And I know we can see this now and it might be like, yeah, make, the, make it simpler and cleaner on the left. But I think it's really important to understand why they did this. So number one, they found that switching between those tabs was actually really infrequent as a support agent. You're actually not moving between those tabs more than once or twice a day, so why not just put it to the side, close it out. Number two is that they didn't actually need to represent the names of what each of these things are, they just use icons. And I actually emailed their product team and I said, hey, why did you guys do it that way instead of labeling it? He said, because we do it so infrequently, um, we can just add a hover and it was taking up too much real estate for the users during our user testing. So if you saw LastPass, they actually put the whole black bar menu there, whereas here they actually tightened it up and got more real estate for where they wanted the user to focus on, which was interacting with customers. So they did a couple of those things really brilliantly, and uh, the icons are very easy and memorable now. So, so that really reduced the cognitive load, and I know internally, it wasn't like they could upsell us on that, but I knew everyone in our organization was now more emotionally invested in this product, which I think uh, really increases the LTV uh, if you're looking at it from sort of a, a metrics or an executive standpoint. So uh, just to recap there, the three things are is really understanding the priority of the use case and the workflow in which they're actually going to. Yes, we can use engagement data to do that, but obser observing our customers is also a great opportunity there. Create focal points. So the LastPass example, they make it very clear that you know you're looking for the brand that you need to edit. And then lastly is observe. Um, what I mean by this is these examples that I've come up with is because I've just tried to pay attention to applications that I enjoy using and trying to figure out what makes them interesting. And so this is a really big point for me and kind of how I've self-taught myself uh, into this field. So the next one is three-click mentality. And this uh, is adding a constraint to creativity in that, in that every single core action needs to be within three clicks. Now, not all, all applications can do this, but it's a great opportunity to challenge yourself. So one of the things when I look at core actions, I think of like the biggest website that I use that's fairly large, and the one that I can think of is Amazon. So I thought to myself, OK, what's a core activity? Not really core, but like secondary. I thought I wanted to see something that I bought recently, and if I wanted to leave that seller feedback, like how far along would I have to go to find something like that? And so. I went in and I was like, okay, where would I go? I thought your account first. Hover is a half click here. And then I had to click on your order, so at one and a half. I scrolled down a bit and then I saw write a product review. And I was like, within two and a half clicks, I got to my core action. And heck, I can buy it again too. So I'm thinking to myself, like, how did this come to be? And this is an organization that has one of the biggest websites in the world. But the design team has clearly thought of trying to constrain how far things are. And it's really easy for us to just say, well, build that into here and build that into here, and now it's nine clicks away, and it's really hidden away. But if you really want to challenge yourself to find things a little sooner, uh, have a three-click mentality rule, or maybe three and a half or two and a half, and try to measure that and see how far things away. It's just a nice litmus test to see how user-friendly your application is. Uh, reversible design. This is uh, definitely a, a, an early, a, not such an old trend, but uh, one that I think more people are embracing. And this is effectively that any major thing that would be jarring to you that you can reverse. Uh, the examples will elicit this, elicit this hopefully more clearly. Uh, so if you have a CRM tool like RelateIQ, uh, setting up filters now. You have a little X there if you want to go back to where you initially were. If you want to delete a file on Drive, you can quickly undo it. If you want to archive a Trello card and you want to pull it back right in the same space, uh, this is called, for me, this is, I coined this as reversible design. That means any of the things where you're like, oh, where did that go? Hey, I lost this. If you get those kinds of support cases, that should trigger you to think, did I not give them some opportunity to reverse that action? Um, especially if they've lost a particular file or they deleted something, I can't get it back. That's where you're not 
necessarily going to upsell them on a new feature from a road mapping perspective, but you have an opportunity for your design team to go in and solve that and work the technology side to make that experience much more seamless. Use verbs with context. Uh, I'm just going to go to the example because I haven't used Slack yet, but I'm excited to now. Uh, so Slack does a really good job of this. We all remember using Windows at some point or still do. But the thing that they love to do is give you options like no, yes, cancel, yes, no, cancel. And you're like, well, hold, what did I just read? And you have to read a couple sentences to try to figure that out. That's increasing your cognitive load and it's, it's making your users think. It's, it's really annoying. It's just a little bit, but you have to go back and uh, you're not really sure if you're taking the right action. Uh, and now you're seeing a lot of great applications give you really just two options. One is the cancel on the left that's slightly gray, and then they give you the verb, either it's a create, it's a delete, it's a save, and then telling you what it's in context to. Again, very simple things, but the language and the text inside of your application can be solved by just keeping a principle like this available to you and your design team to use whenever they're building out a new UI. And the last thing I'll speak on here, which again definitely kind of comes into the emotional ease bucket, is white space is your friend. Uh, I love this one because designers like to tout it, but sometimes are struggling to really kind of introduce the concept of negative space. So one example that I think is really relevant is Again, a very successful company, WordPress, millions of websites out there, but you look at this UI, uh, and today this seems a little bit heavy, at least for me, because the core action here is to write a post and post it. And all of a sudden, I've got categories, I've got publish, I've got a whole menu of words here. And yes, these are all things that I will need to do, either prior or after, but during that activity of writing the content, it becomes really interruptive. And so here comes the medium, and says, we're actually going to do something that's really simple and well-designed. But it's just more than just a well-designed thing. This is actually what I like to think of as design disruption. Here's an organization who's principally based on disrupting WordPress based on design. And I think we're starting to see an emergence of companies like this, and this is a great example of that, where you, this is still a screenshot. It's still matching the background. It's all white. You can just write out your entire post and then put in your social widgets, then put your tags and all your publishing things but they've made that experience a lot more easy for people who might be jarred at WordPress or might be jarred at using a bigger publishing thing. And, and the fact that they can do, still do a lot of stuff shows that you can actually use design as a method, as a competitive advantage, and to disrupt your competitor. So I'm just going to jump into uh, some of the data that I found in design, because I've always wanted to sort of quantify this, and I'm very happy that I found this. Uh, so, so, if you see over here, this is a timeline view of all of the companies that are design-focused firms that have been acquired since 2004. Uh, these are in the first eight years. Obviously, these are sort of the biggest ones, uh, acquisitions. And then all the way over to 2016, and 50% of the firms that were acquired were all in the last two years. That should be fairly striking. And it's not interesting when Shopify or Facebook or Google acquires them. That, to me, is really uninteresting. What's interesting is when you see Capital One, Accenture, Ernest & Young, Deloitte. We're talking about on the chasm, the laggards, the people that are doing things last with respect to this. When they start getting in this game, that should be a really strong signal to executives that if they are behind, that they need to catch up for it. Because macroeconomically, like, this is really important uh, to really cap encapsulate like, what's going on at the highest levels. These are firms that do PowerPoint presentations for a living. And if you've ever been with those consulting firms, they're not the prettiest. Um, and don't get me wrong, I've worked with consultants too, but now they're realizing that how important that is. And so if any of our firms feel like they're struggling, um, there is a really good presentation by Kleiner and Perkins, a VC firm out in uh, the Valley that had led this uh, particular presentation in some of these slides. Uh, some of the other data that really hits a chord with me is that uh, from the Terraskin group, 6x are more likely to buy with a positive emotional response. And the forgiveness of a mistake is way higher. Uh, I don't know if anyone here, and I'm assuming many of you guys do, have uh, you know, really good well-designed products and some maybe that need some improvement. But I've noticed, at least for the people that have bought Roadmunk, they're more forgiving when we have a bug because they really like how pretty it is. Like Somehow people are more forgiving to prettier products. 
and I know when my phone or my iPhone breaks, I'm like, okay, I'll deal with it. I'll just take it to the store and live without it for two days. I'm willing to go through that pain because I'm so emotionally invested in that product. And I think if that's really well understood, um, these groups have now quantified a lot of that information, and that to me is a very compelling statement. Um, the second thing that's uh, even more compelling as a startup founder is that the number of startups being founded by designers is becoming higher and higher in the Valley uh, and Y Combinator. And so kind of this kind of sums it up really nicely is that when Brian from Airbnb started, they were basically, you know, not really well look, looked after. You can actually go online and see all the rejections from investors, which is always uh, kind of a nice feeling I'm supposing for them as a $3 billion company, but they weren't looked at taken seriously. Now today they've kind of set the standard for design in some way with respect to website design and web app design. So how do we put this together? Um, if we have, you know, maybe some of us are very lucky. Do, by the way, just a show of hands here, who in their organization sees design already being, uh, as a core principle, people really like using design? Well, just a show of hands. And who here feels like it's a little bit more of an uphill battle right now? So definitely the majority. Okay. So there's a couple things to think about when, and I'm not going to say that this is a battle you're just going to walk out of here and be like, I know how to win it, but these are some of the ideas and tools that you might be able to leverage. I think the first thing to recognize is that there is an education gap. I think we all are, we appreciate design, we understand its value. Sometimes it's hard to communicate it and I think the language, uh, some of the ideas in here might be helpful. Um, but one is if you've got a very quali quantitative sort of driven or mathy kind of driven executive team is I would just go with the data. I would look at the Kleiner Perkins data that they've done in the presentations and I would go to them with that. Make sure you have a good construct for it. Uh, I'm happy to send these slides over and people to, to leverage them. Uh, and that's where I would start. On the other end of the spectrum, what I used to do with my former CEO is I would kind of go around and see what products he was using and what he really liked. I would actually build an emotional case against him for the things that he appreciated. And then that would be my entry point to be like, well, these are the products you love, and these are the reasons why. Because it tells you what to think, it reduces cognitive load, just look at how much white space and clarity is between the fonts. We use those things, I said, like, if you did that, just imagine what the emotional response would be from our users. And so you can also build in that. Uh, the other opportunity here, and this is uh, another great way to do it, is if you kind of become a little bit of an expert yourself using more high fidelity tools like UX Pen, uh, Sketch, Again, you will have to obviously teach yourself these tools, but if you can kind of give them that image and be like, here, this is what it could look like. I just worked on it this weekend. Look at the difference here. I've made these changes. They're really simple. I can work with the tech team, but this is what the experience would look like, right? It's not necessarily going to, it's hard to say we can get X amount of revenue from this, but I know that our users will be more engaged. I can track this against my NPS score, so you do have an experiment you could be running here in some sense, and they'll appreciate that. And the last and probably the more bolder of the options is to use the company values. I'm assuming here most of us have some company value associated with customers, passion for success, you know, support driven, all of that. And I would tie to that, be like, if, if you want to support our customers in the best way or put them first, why not give them the best emotional experience? That's what you would want out of some products, so let's make sure that they get that same thing. Um, this is obviously a hard argument to tie, but if you've got the right values that you feel like you can tie it to, uh, there is definitely an opportunity there. So design in the MSP. So I, I try to stay away from the language of minimum viable product, unless it's like a kind of an infrastructure related project. But for any feature, we say design uh, an MSP. And what I really mean by that is this is sort of a framework that I think is really helpful and I use this a lot with my product and engineering design teams. And what this kind of used to, this is eliciting, is that we used to think of MVPs as like just get something that's functional out there. It can break and can do all those things. But it was, it was getting that functionality and that workflow there. Uh, what I prefer to think of is yes, it needs to be reasonably functional, but uh, reasonably functional, excuse me, but it needed to have the reliability, the usability, and the emotional design. And the reason for that is because the experience of the user works this way. They go in, they immediately have a reaction to it emotionally based on the design. They start to click around to see if it's usable. Then they're like, oh, this is reliable or not reliable. Now does it really kind of do the core workflows? So if you kind of look at it from how they psychologically enter in, we've taken away the language of MSP and used MSP. 
Um, the reason this is important to start here is that you can then really build a case for making sure design is part of that. And it's no longer MVP, it's, look, we've got to build something that's minimum saleable product. My sales guy needs to be able to sell this to the early adopters and the early innovators. Doesn't need to be the early majority. I'm okay with that because I'll still get some traction and we can use that traction as our next jump off point. And, and that's really where you're able to build design into the chasm. So for those of you who are, I'm assuming product managers in here probably are head nodding when they see this, from, this is basically a model developed by a guy named Jeffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm. And there are five stages uh, of product, like, I mean, how the product gets adopted. And these are different customer segments within them. And getting to the early majority where this is the chasm here is kind of the really difficult part because the requirements here for that particular market is usually vastly different than either of these two groups that are willing to put up with a lot of the bugs, the issues, and the reliability. But these guys are going to try to tug you over, pay you more money, and force your product in that direction. And one of the ways that we've been successful in overcoming this with less resources is getting them to forgive us for the mistakes that we have, whether it's product related, speed, or lack of features. We've just made sure that we've done the design really well to emotionally be like, all right, this is great. And we obviously built out the functionality we think fairly reasonably, but if you're trying to disrupt a market, you're just not going to beat Salesforce at every feature. You're going to have to come in, like Salesforce IQ or Relate IQ, I should say, come in and do a few really good things, make it well designed, and four years later they sold for $400 million to them. Uh, but I feel like from their perspective, they just did an incredible job on design and everyone was really interested in using their product. Uh, so to quickly summarize, uh, sort of the six rules here, tell the user what to think. Uh, if this really means you know the order and what you want them to do in this tool, that means you've probably done interviews and your research really well. Minimize cognitive load. Uh, this is a great term when trying to figure out if things are overloaded. You can always bring in other people in the organization to be like, hey, what, what's your initial reaction to this screen? Uh, the three-click mentality. This is a really nice constraint to work with your design team. Be like, everything has to be within three clicks. So you can actually have this as a principle or a product strategy rule. Uh, reversible design. Uh, use verbs with context again. Language and text is important in your app, and I think some people overlook this. This is a great principle to, to start with. And of course, Whitespace is your friend. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to leave these discussion questions up, but I'm going to leave the floor first open for anyone who has any thoughts, ideas, suggestions, questions. Or... Yes? Can you, I, I think what you have to say about the minimum saleable versus minimum viable is super interesting. Do you see, so so I was really, I'm still really struggling with the concept of minimum viable product, like when the rubber hits the road, like everybody's, oh yeah, I get it, but but internally we spend a lot of time trying to figure out like, well, what does it mean? Now, so for example, sorry, I don't mean to turn this into an autobiographical question, but, I, but um, if you look at what people mean by MVP, they talk about the Dropbox MVP was a video of how it worked. There wasn't any functionality at all. And what they were thinking of is MVP means what, what do we need to do to start learn, learning from our potential customers? Right. And I'm curious whether, do you see the MSP sort of replacing the MVP VP thinking, or, you, or is, it, is, is, is it like another step after that? I'm just curious it's how It's exactly they... that. Yeah, okay. you took the words out. It's oh. the stage. So like early on, if you aren't sure what you're going to build, and, you want, and your goal is to learn from your customers, well, you can't really sell them anything yet because you don't even know what problem your pain you're solving. So MVP definitely makes sense. We're at the stage now where we have a really good understanding of what our market needs. Um, with respect to roadmaps and, and the enterprise. So for us, it's like, if my product manager says we got an MVP, well then I'll look at this and I say, is this sellable, right? I, I, I know what it takes to get sellable and it's maybe an extra week of work. Make sure it's there because we want the product at a higher standard. And I don't necessarily think you're losing that much time on the product development side. But for, yeah, the definition, it's a stage thing. I think early, really early on, maybe you're still kind of doing some customer discovery. Then maybe MVP makes a lot more sense. But if you're past maybe the first tranche uh, of innovators and you're kind of working your way to the adopters and the early majority, I think MSPs is, uh, is a word that resonates at least with me more. And this model kind of helps me too because then you know, if they're tying it to sales, we'll then make sure we have something that they're going to sell. 
Um, how important do you think it is to involve designers during like the discovery process? It's critical. Because um, that's kind of something I'm having like a problem with like a lot of different places where they, you know, like the discovery process is really handled by like the art director and then it's sort of like a trickle down effect into telling the designers what they need to do as mm. opposed to giving them like an idea of what it is that like like the whole big picture all together. So one of the things uh, that we like to say on top of all of this is design is not a luxury. And what I mean by that is that if Ernest & Young is going to buy design companies, we, we, this is no longer going to be a thing that we can always rely on as an advantage. It's going to be a baseline. And so if you're a case, if, what are your design principles in your organization? It sounds like you're in a creative organization based on what you kind of just told me. If the principles are to understand the user, to make sure that you're integrated, uh, to be empathetic, I mean, that's probably the most common one. Empathy to me is like you're engaging directly with that person. Right? Empathy isn't two steps removed and having someone in between me and my sister to have a handle a dialogue, that would be crazy. So, so for me, it's like you can tie in that case, I would be tying it to the principles of the organization. Uh, and again, that's it may be difficult too, but you have to find a way to get yourself in that room and be like, hey, look, like I understand that we're getting this information, we're happy to work on it, but I think it would be really valuable for us to sit in on that conversation for the following reasons. One, we're able to ask them questions like X, Y, and Z, and then you would list them as a designer because you're able to see things from a different perspective. And two, when we're in that room, these are the kinds of conversations that, that would lead down the road because we're designers and we approach it from this angle, right? So the same example applies when a sales guy goes on in a call, a product manager sitting there like, you're just thinking completely differently about this conversation. You're thinking about what problems they're having, how do they work, how often they're using their app. The sales guy is just trying to figure out how to close the deal. So you have to use that same sort of argument to say, these are the reasons why we need to be in the room, these are the conversations we're going to have, and this is why it's important. And then hopefully you can say, because we want to tie it to this value. Yes? Uh, so you were talking about um, executive buy-in. Um, with things like uh, you know redesigning, for example, um, it's kind of hard to tie that to a data point, right, or, or, a, or a metric. Um, what are some of your suggestions there? Anyone been through redesign here? Yeah. I want to see, what, how did you guys deal with it? Uh, we showed them how bad it sucked, and then with all like the feedback that we got from our players, and then did a couple sketches, showed them what it could be. I think I buy off on that. If there's no data point, you don't do a redesign. Like, the data could be like, our players told us this sucked, or like they're leaving and doing this. And sure, like, and yeah. That's a starting point. Mm -hmm. I think in different ways, if you're trying to keep, if you're doing a redesign just to do a redesign, ask yourself why. Right? Is it because we're now on a mobile device and we need to be on like multiple devices? We should already be there, but you can help say like you have way too much tech debt I need to change it or are we're going to China and we need to be like left aligned so we need to be able to account for those things like figure out what you're why you're actually doing the redesign yeah I mean we wrap a hypothesis around a redesign so okay well is there a good and it, is that hypothesis gonna move the needle for us and then we split test it what was the what was the metric you don't mind me asking <coughs> uh, is it Traffic to our registration page, right? Because our product, the registration funnel, sits outside of our product. Uh -huh. So our metric was driving uh, traffic to the registration funnel. Absolutely. And we felt like design was prohibiting that. There was no emotional. There was usability, and there was just poor brand efficacy. We weren't representing what we were trying to get people to, re to register for very yeah. well. Yeah. And it worked. Uh, but it was very hard, and even after that, we, we you know, the metrics are there, everyone can see the, the wins, we, we made our goals, it, it's still, design still a challenge in our company. Did you end up putting in sort of principles after that, realizing how important it was, about how you would go about design from there forward? Um, no, because it's kind of a, it, it gets into politics and things that would take too long to explain. Design kind of sits outside of our, our group, so it's kind of like there's yeah. bandwidth issues. Yeah, I think that the key point here is just to figure out why you want to do it. Our the company I used to work for our our audience was traffic engineers. They didn't they didn't care about the redesign, right? Like I could have vouched for it in a million different ways, but at the end of the day, I don't think it would have incre incre increased our business value there. Uh, but the current audience I serve, product managers, it does matter to them, and so we had these core tenants and we started using empathy and we actually started, you could take an iterative approach too, 
Uh, there is ways where you can introduce smaller elements and smaller chunks if, if the code base is kind of privy to that architecture. If you want to start from scratch, yeah, you're going to have to build a really good case. Uh, and that's, that's definitely going to be a challenge. But I'm happy to take that a little offline and dive into it deeper. And I think these answers have been helpful as well. Here's a good question. Um, Latif, when you're thinking about MSP and let's say you have a cross-functional team, how do you or your product guys get alignment with an engineer on what the MSP is? Uh, <laughs> It's driven from sales. Okay. So sales and product degree first before engineering. It's like if, and, and you know it doesn't have to be sales, it has to be the user too. It's like, here's what the users are wanting, here is what product says. And if sales and product can nod their head together in agreement, because our sales guys are, they're not the, I, I don't want to say they're prototypical, yes they, they can sell and do this stuff, but they're like, no, I understand what an MSP, I understand what an MVP is, I understand a little bit of the tech. If you just give me this bit, I'll, I'll take it from here, right? They don't go, I need this. So I think there's a sales engineering culture. They're like technically savvy. And then what that translates to is our product manager goes, oh, okay, that's even less than I thought, right? Like that's actually happened a couple times, which is really strange. But then they go to engineers and engineers like, this is why they have to make the case because our engineers are also fairly business savvy and they're like, okay, so why are you doing this? What do you, how is this going to work and how are you going to sell it? And they'll make that, that data, they'll cross-functionally, you, you, convert that language from sales to engineering, and that's how we've defined it. Because a lot of the times we had MVP, and everyone's like, well, what's an MVP? And I'm like, well, it has to be able to still be sellable. They're like, well, no, it's an MVP. And I'm like, okay, I'm not using that word anymore. This is bad for the culture, because then all of a sudden, everything's being put together in two days, and it's kind of like just chunked in, and you're like, well, that's not adding any value yet. So I wanted to kind of raise the bar a little bit higher. And yes, if it takes a little bit longer, I'm, I'm always okay with that. Sure. Just hire more engineers. Like a specific example from like Ruidmunk or like just past stuff about this like idea of the MSP and like maybe somewhere specific where you you know like made this trade off in features or whatever to build something that was a little more interesting and sellable. Yeah, uh, ooh, I really I want to try to shy away from the selling part perspective of this. I'm just gonna try and think of an app that. There's so many, uh, just to kind of get decision craziness. Uh, I would say one of the things that we did uh, that was a huge... Uh, well, actually, I'll talk about something early on we did, because it's a year and a half ago. So our software is really focused around presentations for Roadmaps too, because we want to be in the executive boardroom. It's kind of one of our big tenants. And so early on, uh, we we're like, all right, we'll just you know export to PDF, and we'll just create this output that you can just download. And that was an MVP, you know, you could, and you could even technically sell it to a certain degree. But I said, what, where are executives really living? This is about 24 months ago. And I said, they're, they're living in PowerPoint, right? I mean, I've got me and one other engineer, me and my co-founder. And I said, how do we get this into a presentation slot, right? Like, how do we perfectly fit it to that? And he said, well, we could do this. We could make sure that it fits these dimensions four by three. We can even do printouts for A4 letter and legal. I'm like, this is more than an MVP. But I said, if we're going to live in the boardroom and we're going to emotionally wow them, let's build an export engine in which you can select dimensions of what that output is. And then we'll do some sort of like algorithmic fit. And I'm like, at this part of the conversation, I'm like, we've just increased scope by like a month, right? And I said, you know what, let's, let's I think, let's go validate this. So we talked to a few of our early customers and prospects. And they said, that sounds crazy amazing, go do that, and we'll pay you for it. So okay. So I've, I've got a little bit of a tie-in. So what we did is we built an engine where you can export to 4 by 3 you can export to letter legal, you can print it out, you can set the DPIs on those papers, you can get the printouts you want. And so that was an example of where, for us, like we went above and beyond, we spent the extra month, but then when we did our demos, and I was like, this is what it can do, all of a sudden now, the product manager was like, wow, my executives are going to love this. Like, I know that I don't have a problem now fighting budget because I just solved their problem. So we figured out who the budget holders were. We figured out why they would want to pay us, and we solved their pain in a way that I think went above and beyond an MVP. And now that's, you know, something that I guess we can tell. So that's one example from our product. Yes? How much role does the competition in the features and the competitive product pay? Um, uh, how much role does it play into your MVP design? 
Uh, in, in our particular context, I mean, this is a very highly contextual question, I'll say. In our particular case, early on, it didn't make that much of a difference. My co-founder and I were effectively in charge of building road mapping software inside of another organization, so we knew the pain point really well. And then we were like, okay, we're going to solve for the people, because we went into a room similar to this, and we were, it was a product management roundtable. We, we were just tossing out ideas, and someone's like, we'll pay you for that. And they said, but this is what I need built. And so we said, okay, does this look generic enough from a market perspective to build a company off of? Uh, but we didn't, we didn't really look at the competition then. We didn't, we, yeah, we did, it played somewhat of a role, but I don't think it played a huge role. I think later stages, you go down into the early majority and the late majority of the chasm, you really need to know what your differentiation is and how you're different, what your value proposition is. Um, but early on in our context, it didn't make a difference. My guess is that if you ask that to anyone else in this room, they're going to have a different answer because they're in a different space. It's highly competitive. You may be building a mobile game. You might be building something else where the competition either doesn't matter at all or it significantly matters because you need to carve out your competitive advantage in a big way early on. So that's, that's going to be really dependent on what market and product you're building. Uh, this is kind of a personal question, but what, what made you get into product? Why are you so passionate uh, about this, just getting up in front of a room and talking to people? And your passion obviously comes through, and I'm very similar, and that's the reason why I'm asking the question. Can you share a little story? It's very. It's like, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, where's my motivation come from? I've got to dig deep for that. Uh, I, I, hmm, I don't know how to answer that. I started out just playing poker. That was, that was my first profession, really, after university. So went on circuit, did a whole bunch of stuff. But I wanted to like build something. I wanted to build something big. And uh, so I built a social network for poker players, because that's all I knew. And that crumbled after I raised a million bucks, which is a great experience. But after I saw that I could take, I worked at a company called MyVision, and very quickly we built software that basically counted cars at intersections. It was like transformative to see a company go from 200,000 revenue to 20 million revenue in three years. So I was like, like, wow, product manager can have that an impact on an entire market, like a team of three people leading that charge can do that. That to me was just fascinating. Um, I don't really know, understand how I got motivated, I just think you go through the 10,000 hour rule and all of a sudden at the end you're like, oh, I love what I do, even though I hated it at the beginning. It's, it's just <laughs> it's a psychological pathway that I don't even know, of. I don't know how to answer that directly, but you just love what you do if you do it long enough, I think. Or maybe you're like Andre Agassi and you just hate playing tennis, but it's all you know. <laughs> hey, um, in regards to your saying, where is design broken? Yeah. Um, one of the ways that my company, I think, designed is broken is that um, the CEO is trying to design. So <laughs> I have that problem too. Yeah, like he'll, I gotta talk to him. I don't mean to be, like, yeah, I don't mean to be rude, but he'll, um, he'll see something, he'll see a new site, and he'll get really excited. And he'll say, hey, this is what we should be doing. Cool. And then he'll see another new site and say, hey, this is what we should be doing. So it kind of takes the power away from the PM, takes power away from design. So do you have a way of... What's your first reaction when he or she says that? What's it based on? Is that just your opinion? That's what I, that's what I think. I think and what's just, the response? If I were to say that to the CEO? Yeah. I, like, or just like, why? Why do you think that? Well, like, do you um, feel like he or she would be resistant to that? Usually is because... Probably not. Okay. Not appreciate it, but... Um, usually the response would be something along the lines of, um, they're doing well. Yeah. Or like, we want to be them. Yeah. Like, they're kind of mimicking, trying to get out of the idea of like mimicking other, what other people are doing. Well, the first thing is I appreciate the fact that that CEO likes design, may not actually know why they like design, right? It's like, we love products we use, but sometimes we don't even know why we really like them. One of my kind of mentors in design, his name's Hoosie. He came in and was like, these are the reasons you like things that are well designed. And he started talking to us about cognitive load, white space, all these principles. He goes, these are the reasons you love that. So when you see this particular font, it evokes this emotion. And so he's like, you need to understand what all these categories of fonts mean, because otherwise you won't know how to pick one. And if you're putting two fonts together, now you have two emotions to deal with, and you've got to figure out what that means. And so when someone sees a good design, they're often encumbered by the lack of language to explain that. And I think a designer's job is to say, ah, actually, I love this site too. I'll tell you the three reasons why I think you like the site and tell me if you agree. One, because they do things like this, they space it that way, they put at the forefront the things that they think their users want, which are these three categories. And what we do is we do this, and our design looks like this, this, and this, and this is why we do it, and so here is the gap. And with this gap, this is the reasons why I think that. And if you create that construct and that conversation with the right language, 
which I'm going to keep hitting on that word, you're going to put yourself in a position of A, they're going to, you're going to win their heart because you're like, yes, you get me, you understand me. You're putting the words to articulate my thoughts. And two, now you're taking action on it. I mean, at that point, you've won them over. But it's, it's about really being able to articulate uh, that in a conversation. I think that's, that's the, the key point there. Has, any, has anyone else been through that? I'm curious to know. Um, I'm also dealing with the same experience, but at a different level. Like in my case, what's happening is they were like, okay, put in the right user stories, which I did. And, uh, you know, I, I'm an engineer, so I try to stay away from the technology so that I don't speak too much. But at the same time, when the volumes are increasing, the product is breaking up. The infrastructure is not able to support it. So for me, I'm like, should I understand infrastructure to write better user stories? How do I overcome this thing? So there's a break happening, but because of. Yeah. Uh, I think product managers. To a degree, you should understand the architecture. Yeah. Like when our PM came in, he was like, "All right, tell me about the architecture." It was our first question. Like, tell me every technical detail. I was like, oh, "Okay, that's going to be a long time." But I think to a degree, you're going to be a better TPM if you do that. Uh, otherwise, you're you're end up going to sit closer to sales, which is not a bad thing. Then sort of the PMM role kind of kicks in. But if you're able to write a user story, understanding those other pieces of the infrastructure. You'll make A, your life easier, B, engineers won't have to come back and give you feedback on every user story because you'll have kind of understood that. Um, uh, that's just kind of comes with time and experience, I think. Uh -huh. I don't really know if there's a kind of a golden nugget for, for that. I do. Another question. So it looks like, and I think I agree that design is becoming ever more important in product, and it, product managers historically have been either technical product manager or product marketing manager. Where do you see it going with like a product manager design? Like, how, how did, how, wh where does our role play in that, ro in that space? Uh, well, so uh, the role is now, they traditionally call it a UX UI designer. I like the term product designer. It really is like you own the design of the product. It's the new kind of fourth bubble, if you will, next to TPM, strategic PM and PMM. And I mean, I don't necessarily know where they would sit in the pragmatic framework. I don't think it takes into consideration design. I think design has been an externality to that. Uh, but now it certainly has to be the home of it. And for me, it's a foundation, right? Like one of our core values is design is not a luxury. I mean, if that's the espoused value in an organization, I no longer have to worry about, you know, like I will create a product design role and they'll sit next to the team. Um, but a lot of the times, if we don't have that role, I think it's on the product manager to A, figure out how to lead it or B, get that role involved in the organization and champion through language to coach the rest of the organization on how to bring it in, and obviously using some of the arguments here to really make sure that it's part of core focus for the, for the product. Again, not all products actually need design. I've worked in a company that doesn't need I'm speaking more generically about that. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Please, uh, yeah, yeah, one more, I guess one more question before time. Who wants to take it? Cool. It's I, it seems like a theme that a couple, a couple people have talked about, I think your question in particular about design and where design people fit in, in the discovery process comes down to really kind of cultural issues and people trusting each other. Uh, boy, have I felt struggling with that in different places I work. Can you talk a little bit about the culture you're building and, and how to make that happen? So I guess I'm in a fortunate position uh, since our co my co-founder and I kind of really emphasize culture. We've seen bad cultures, which I think lent itself to us building what we think is a much greater culture. Uh, we looked at what our core values are and what we wanted for our business, and we knew that, that we could translate design out of that. And we just said, this is going to be one of our competitive advantages. We just kind of decreed it to ourselves. Now, that doesn't necessarily happen in all organizations when you've got a 1,000 people and you're working bottom up. It's, it's really kind of, you're always going to, I think, at least I think, there's always going to be one related to the customer. And if you can kind of use that as your jump off point, you're, each department's probably going to have its own set of core values, the product team, the sales team, the marketing team. Uh, if there is a design team, which I suspect there probably is, what are their core values, and are they being espoused loudly enough? If empathy is there, talking to the user, if iteration, all those experimentation, all those types of ideas are there, there's no reason why those shouldn't be speaking as loud as revenue from sales and hitting your NPS score and product. There, there's no reason that shouldn't be yelling loud enough. But someone has to champion that. And 
oftentimes we don't have designers that are loud enough, like Brian and Airbnb, who effectively thought designers just work for people. Well, I disagree. I think designers should lead people. I think they should lead the way forward. And uh, so I didn't have any designers to lead the way forward, so I just kind of figured out how to turn myself into one. And I just said, okay, smart designers, where are you? Sit down and I'm holding you down until you teach me everything. And that's, that's, that was kind of one of the approaches I took. I think there's other ways of doing it. I'm trying to build it into the educational onboarding and HR through that. There's, there's all their different means in bigger companies. Um, I haven't worked in companies over 200 people, so I don't know all of your challenges in that regard, but it sounds like you might have that. So there, there are some ideas there, and we can afterwards we can also talk a little bit about that. I'd be curious to get a little further into the context of your problem, um, so I can lend some more specifics there. All right. Thank you, guys.